everyone for joining us on our bringing vehicle to grid services into the Australian market webinar. Um, we've got some great presenters today and really looking forward to the Q&A session at the end. My name's Alex, I work at the Electric Vehicle Council and we were co-founders of the Charge Together Fleets program with Daniel Hilson from Move Energy. Um, this is obviously part of our webinar series, Charged Up, and that's one of the resources available as part of the program. We've moved today actually to the webinar function of Zoom. So rather than using the chat that we usually use, if you could please just ask your questions in the Q&A section at the bottom of the screen. Um, it's exciting today to have Bjorn and Dean from ANU University and SG Feet presenting on their REVS project. So that's the Realising Electric Vehicles to Grid Services. And this is an arena funded project to look at how fleet integration of vehicle to grid services can help with fleet management and stabilizing the grid. Dan Hilson is the co-founder of the Charge Together Fleets program and the major sponsor, and he's also CEO and founder of Live Energy. So without further ado, I'll hand over to our presenters. We'll be hearing from Bjorn first and then from Dean. All right, thank you very much, Alex. And just before I begin, um, I'd like to pay my respects to the traditional owners of the land on which I am, which is the Ngunnawal and Nambri people down here in um, pretty sunny ACT. Um, and also uh, collectively to wherever we're all dialing in from. Um, oh, can I please share screen that's currently disallowed? You should have that access as the panel section. Yeah, I don't know. It says host is disabled. I'll make you the host for now. Awesome. Here we go. All right. Are we cooking? Yep, that looks good. Okay. All right. So this um, project, which is abbreviated to REVS, um, has been supported by the Australian Renewable Energy Agency through their Advancing Renewables program. Um, it's a joint initiative by seven organisations listed down here at the bottom. And as we'll kind of emphasise throughout the presentation, the project is only possible because of this um, cross-sector collaboration. So the presentation today is going to start by um, covering what Vehicle to Grid is um, and why we should all care about it, um, and then dive into what we're doing in the REVS project. Um, and then I'll hand over to Dean, um, who will be talking about what Vehicle to Grid means for fleets and for fleet managers in particular. Um, so I'm not particularly good at patience, so I'm just going to go straight up and tell you what um, the key messages are from this presentation. So vehicle to grid, the way I would think about that is that it's the um, sector coupling of mobility and energy coming together um, and that creates a, some really tremendous opportunities across both sectors, both for mobility and for the energy se sector. Um, in REVS, what we're doing is we're um, bringing vehicle to grid into the Australian markets um, and then laying the um, roadmap for then scaling from our demonstration of 51 vehicles um, to it becoming a staple of the market here in Australia. Um, and for what does B2G mean for fleet managers? It means it's really transforming the role of a fleet manager from an operations role where you're managing expenses uh, to a more strategic role where you're both um, generating revenue as well as managing expenses. So vehicle to grid um, really just refers to um, the ability of electric vehicles to discharge power um, out of the battery into the grid um, or sometimes also into buildings, but from the car out. Um, that requires both the vehicle to be able to um, do V2G and really critically also for the charger uh, to be bi-directional, which means they can both charge the vehicle and allow this, the vehicle to discharge. So really simple as a concept, um, but what it does is that it, it uh, brings into play new um, relationships with that discharged power, the power that's coming out of the vehicle. Um, that needs to find a home within the electricity network, which is here, the, the DNSP. Um, and also within the electricity market, which is managed by a retailer. So while it's quite a simple concept, um, it really involves new values um, and really requires us to change how we conceive of electric vehicles. Um, it requires new business models um, and new customer relationships. So that's really very rich and that's where a lot of um, 
our work will be focused. So the, the end benefits of vehicle to grid and the, of these new values that um, are being unlocked through vehicle to grid, um, they have to end up being attractive to customers. Um, and they can be so kind of through both financial, by providing financial benefits and non-financial benefits. Um, the financial benefits um, come from being able to manage your electricity bills and create savings, both by managing your load in regards to electricity prices and also demand charges if you're um, exposed to those, and also by maximizing the amount of solar that you may be generating or using that you may be generating on um, the building's property. So those things tend to be referred to as vehicle to home or vehicle to building, uh, but it's the same essential technology. Um, and then the second way in which um, customers can benefit financially is by having their vehicles provide services to the grid, um, with either to retailers or to the network companies or to the system operator um, as a whole. In addition to those financial benefits, um, there are also really important non-financial benefits that come from V2G. Um, these include greater feelings of self-sufficiency and independence in how you provide and secure your electricity. Um, the security that you get from being able to have backup power, so an electric vehicle can store multiple days worth of electricity for a typical Australian household, uh, which is invaluable when you have natural disasters and other um, causes of blackouts. Um, and there's also a real satisfaction of contributing to the decarbonisation of uh, your electricity system as a whole, um, both by maximising the renewables power that's being generated and utilised from your own roof, um, and also from the system as a whole, um, by providing these grid services. The other stakeholders that really benefit a lot from, from vehicle to grid um, is the electricity system. Um, so as you're probably aware of all of um, Australia's cars or vehicles were to switch over to being electric, that would place a really large load onto the electricity system. Um, if all of Australia's vehicles were to do so, they'd probably add around a third um, to our peak demand placed on the network, which the network absolutely cannot handle currently. Um, so that's kind of the worst case scenario if um, all of our vehicles were electrified and, and not managed well. But what vehicle to grid means is that it transforms these vehicles from a, a kind of a liability as a load um, to a tremendous asset of the, a really tremendously large energy storage um, capacity that's extremely fast and flexible um, and, and incredibly versatile in that sense. Um, and so the, the pictures here just relate to the fact that if, even if one in five Australian vehicles were to be electrified and, and have vehicle to grid, um, they'd have a storage capacity that, was, that would be greater than uh, 20, uh, 2,000 of the Tesla big batteries down in South Australia, which until last week were the largest batteries in the world. Um, or they'd also be larger than the planned Snowy 2.0 hydro, um, pumped hydro works down in, in the Snowies. So that just gives you a sense of the kind of scale of um, the opportunity that vehicle to grid represents to the electricity system. So to, to summarise just this first bit of what is vehicle to grid, um, vehicle to grid is the joining of mobility and energy. Um, it really transforms our conception of what a vehicle is. It's no longer this underutilised asset that mostly is just parked in your garage um, and only costs you money to run. Um, it's something that is also utilised when it's plugged in um, and can actually generate revenue for you, as we'll see in, in our demonstration in a moment. Um, this is a really exciting proposition, but it's also quite challenging in um, understanding and forming new values and new meanings and new conversations for customers and for all of the different stakeholders involved. Um, I've mentioned that electric vehicles through V2G can be used to power buildings, um, power the home. They can also be used to power um, the grid. Um, and there's an exciting opportunity to also use them to transport electricity. So you might charge your vehicle at work um, drive your vehicle home and then power your home overnight from um, the power that you stored um, from your workplace, for instance. And the opportunity of vehicle to grid for the electricity system is tremendously large because of its energy capacity um, and the fact that batteries are extremely fast and flexible in how um, they can provide power when needed. So moving on to what we're doing in the REVS project, 
Um, as a kind of precursor to that or the historical context is the vehicle to grid is a pretty well established technology. It's been around since the 70s, uh, but it spent most of its life looking something like this um, and really only being played with in laboratories around the world. It hasn't made that jump um, into the real world in commercial deployments. Um, but that is exactly what we're doing in the REVS project. So we now are working with a commercially available um, vehicle, which is the Nissan LEAF. It comes with a warranty for us doing vehicle to grid. Um, and we're also working with a commercially available um, charger, which is made by a company called Wallbox. Um, and as you can see, contrasting this picture from the previous one, it's a much, much smaller unit, um, much more affordable and much more kind of uh, sane to have that installed in your garage. And the other thing that I want to mention to this slide is that while I'm about to go through some of the kind of details of what we're doing um, in the um, REVS project, kind of the services that we're delivering, the end result is meant to be as, as simple as this. And what we're shooting for is that it will be as simple as this, um, is that you buy commercially available products, install them, um, and then have V2G functioning um, perfectly for you. So in our project, we've got these seven partners, um, and those are really crucial so that we can um, kind of work through what vehicle to grid means for the transport system, as well as the electricity system. So in this case, we've got, um, we're working with a, a government fleet primarily from the ACT government, SG fleet manage those vehicles. We're also working with um, the car manufacturer, which is Nissan, um, the charge, um, charging infrastructure installer and manager, which is Jet Charge. Actua AGL are the retailer who will be representing the power from these vehicles into the electricity market. Um, and we're running the trial here in the ACT. So we're also working with the distribution network service provider, which is Evo Energy. So they own and manage the, the poles and wires down here. Um, our team at the ANU is kind of supporting this demonstration um, kind of across the board. And then doing a lot more research, a kind of how can we scale from um, this demonstration here in a very particular use case with a very particular customer um, to a much more broadly applicable um, proposition that works for um, mums and dads, for businesses, for everyone, and it fully captures all of the different revenue streams that are on offer. So like I said, we in the REVS project are demonstrating one very particular service um, in one very particular context. So the service that we're delivering is called Contingency Frequency Control Ancillary Services, um, which is a, a mouthful, but what, so I'll just run through what that really means. Um, what we're trying to do is we're trying to help balance the electricity system. So it's incredibly important for the electricity system that the power that is generated at every microsecond is balanced by the amount of load put on the on the system. So supply always has to equal demand, and that has to be true at all times. Um, we That's quite a, a challenging thing to do because we're all running around turning light switches on and off as we wish. Um, the, it, the kind of key for the electricity system is that the mismatch or the balance between supply and demand um, gets reflected in the frequency of the, the electricity. So electricity is an, an alternating current and that has a certain a frequency to it, which is something that we can measure. Um, so what we're doing in, and I should mention, so in, here in Australia, the frequency that is, is good, that shows that the system is in balance is 50 Hertz. But then if we either have too much supply or not enough supply, um, that frequency will increase in, or decrease, which indicates that there's a mismatch. And if that gets left to increase or decrease too far, um, then we're gonna have blackouts. So what are we doing with our vehicles? Our vehicles, you know, kind of in cartoon form, um, will be monitoring, plugged into the, their chargers. The chargers monitor the frequency of the power system. Um, and then say an electricity, like a storm comes through and knocks out the connection to um, a coal-fired generator or a wind farm, and somehow we lose a lot of um, supply of electricity, then our frequency is gonna to start to drop. Our vehicles, or better say really the chargers, um, notice that, and then within a fraction of a second, um, the power that's stored within the, the car's battery will be discharged into the grid to help contribute to rebalancing the system, bringing it back into a secure state. So why are we focusing on this particular service? 
Um, the beauty of this service is that the vehicles um, get paid to be on call. So whenever the vehicles are plugged in, um, the owner of the vehicles, in this case, the, AC, uh, the ACT government, um, will be getting remunerated by the electricity market for them being on call and available to help support the grids. Now, we estimate that that will be about $1,000 a year, which is probably more than three times as much in revenue as what the vehicles will be um, costing the government to charge with electricity. So it's a considerable amount of revenue that they'll be um, receiving from this one service. Um, and the really nice thing is the contingency, so big storms that take out parts, big parts of the electricity system are pretty infrequent. Um, so the vehicles will only actually be discharging power into the grid maybe a dozen times a year. So it really start, is very, a very suitable service to start with um, because you have quite a, a generous amount of revenue, but you have very little, um, you're calling on the, the, electri the electricity within the vehicles quite rarely. So you have minimal impact on the vehicles, which is a, a very conservative place for us to start. The other thing um, that I think is, is really neat about this is that frequency control, balancing the system in this way, um, is very, it's a crucial thing for all power grids, but it's particularly important as we um, install more and more renewables, um, which have some variability to them, and we can balance that through the energy stored in batteries and also the energy stored in electric vehicle batteries. So like I said, um, that is kind of a look under the hood, if you will, um, of exactly what we're up to in the REVS project. But the, the end result um, is that we're working with 51 vehicles here in the ACT, most 50 of them from the ACT government. And by the time that we're done, we have to have a really simple proposition um, that can be rolled out to other fleets that you don't have to know much about how um, the power system works or why we need contingency FCAS or anything else. You just have a simple value proposition of you buy these commercially available vehicles um, and then they start earning revenue for you. Um, like I said, at the ANU, a big part of our um, role in the project is to explore the full value stack of vehicle to grid. So not just this one service, but more broadly, what are all of the other services that um, vehicle to grid can deliver? Um, and to assess those, not just financially, but also look at their technical details. So how do they interact with the um, strength of the power system, voltages, other things like that with different types of in inverters. Um, what are the value, economic values of those services um, to customers, to owners, to other stakeholders within the, the system? Um, what are the social benefits that can be delivered through vehicle to grids? Um, and then to wrap that up in recommendations for rules, incentives, and regulations to really accelerate and smoothen the deployment of vehicle to grid in Australia. Um, so this is a, our roadmap. Um, we we're starting with these 51 vehicles here in the ACT um, and then are working through um, a lot of research and a lot of knowledge sharing um, to accelerate that um, and then to smoothen the deployment through better in incentives and policies in government and industry support. So that's REVS. I feel like I've talked about that enough um, and I'll now hand over to Dean. So Dean, just let me know when to swap. Lovely, um, thank you very much. So, so I guess um, from my perspective and, and a lot of the, the, the audience today will be more uh, interested probably from, from our perspective, the technical side Bjorn has covered off is more about the impact on fleets. So within SG Fleet, I guess before we talk what v, V2G will, will, will bring to it in the future state, I just want to spend a, a couple of slides just really talking about the, the current state um, as a fleet manager. Um, one of the things that we're trying to do is, is in, in a sense, normalize electric vehicles uh, uh, and help our clients electrify their fleets uh, through, through products such as eStart. So I guess, uh, and we, we, you know, Bjorn talked on the, on the social side of it, is, is to, uh, part of this approach is to try and, and, and find out how we simplify this, how as a fleet, we can get to that future stage where there will be additional uh, benefits. So I guess if, if we look at today, uh, and, and certainly from a zero emission vehicle, so certainly uh, battery electric vehicles, the decentralization of, of refueling, that, that's one of the major 
challenges or, or mindset changes, but that's a, a very much a positive that we try and emphasize to our fleets is that you can then certainly put the ability to, to charge and, and control those costs because you can do it when and where you want to. Um, but I guess the, the, the critical message we're, we're getting across in electric vehicles is obviously the lower operating costs and, uh, and obviously we touched on fuel security as well. So just jumping ahead uh, the slide, one of the things that we, we, we do talk with, with our clients is to try and get that uh, understanding of fit for purpose. So our EVs suitable for fleets. So we can talk about different elements, be it performance of an instant torque of a vehicle, the efficiency. So again, if you're in a metro environment, but a lot of, um, you know, again, depending on, on the type of work that you do, um, if you have a lot of idle, then this can be a more beneficial uh, vehicle for you. Obviously safety, but lower, lower running costs. And range, so again, we, we're trying to uh, 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 get that understanding to the average fleet, uh, where we're seeing the average weekly travel is around 300 Ks for, for most fleet vehicles. The range of EVs that we have today already in Australia more than more than adequate for that and we are starting to see evs with comparable costs in the fleet today so on the, on this next slide i just wanted to share a quick example from the ACT government fleet who uh, transitioned to zev at the start of uh, last year uh, last financial year and uh, they, they took in uh, first in the first this generation of evs with the high on the ionics and we've been able to look at that a, a, a little case study in, against a couple of uh, internal combustion engines and Mitsubishi Air Sixes, all in exactly the same car park, all for doing virtually the same thing. And this covers COVID as well. But the, I guess the key takeaway here is we're looking at, at the running costs, and, and this is before V2G, before solar, where we are actually paying for electricity today. We can still see around a 70% reduction in running costs between maintenance and electricity uh, for these. So it's becoming making uh, EVs not just a project, but a very much a viable uh, fleet solution. And we hope to uncover uh, with, with the with the RES project even more value. So I guess SG Fleet's um, role uh, in, in the RES project on the next slide. What do we, why are we part of the, the seven? Um, and again, we're not offering the technical expertise, but as a fleet manager, it's obviously we want to adapt and, and change um, some of the nature of fleets. So up, and, up, until, up until now, we've always been talking about expenditure or consumption. So is, is that vehicle um, tracking according to what it's meant to do? Uh, is the fuel efficiency correct? So hopefully with VTG, we now start to talk about opportunities from a behavior perspective to earn revenue. And they're the behaviors that we want to certainly highlight and, and, and uh, bring about any exceptions. So for us, there's a lot of development change in reporting and to help drive those behaviors from, from fleece to take advantage of opportunities that the projects such as VTG will, will bring about. So if I look at the expected outcomes uh, on the next slide for, from, from REVs, we hope that this will allow us to gain insight into that petition, uh, additional value for, for EVs, certainly that are capable of V2G. Right now, obviously with Nisleep, but there are more and more options coming on board. I guess this is certainly gonna change how the fleet asset is, is, is very much traditionally viewed. So today we can look at a very much a, a fleet as a self-contained vehicle. V2G is now starting to change that stance. It's incorporating the battery as a productive asset in its own right for the grid or the site. Now, obviously we're talking about vehicle to grid, but there could be opportunities as, as, as Bjorn said of taking power from work going to, off to a site. So that in itself will, will change that. So normal behavior, and that's what we want to find is the normal vehicles, the 50 within the ST government fleet, doing their everyday uh, work that they're meant to do within the fleet. But if we can establish that normal behavior leading to additional revenue opportunities, this is certainly going to add a lot of value to, to the EV proposition. And we would expect that to be reflected in, in future resale values. So we're look, trying to look at the impact of whole of life cost. And to give you an idea, and you can just get all the little bits up, up, up on the screen, um, 
the fleet costs, I guess, where do we see V2G impacting on this? So this is typically the, 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 the cost profile of a fleet vehicle today. So some of the, the key drivers here, obviously depreciation is one of the key things. So with V2G, will this impact on the depreciation of a vehicle? The residual value, a V2G capable vehicle, will it be more valuable? Will it have further use just beyond the used car? Or are we going to start to look at this vehicle now as being a multiple Powerwall, Tesla Powerwall? So, um, so we'll look at the capacity of the battery. I touched on before, obviously, fuel costs and driver behavior. If we can, if V2G can now demonstrate a positive cash flow, then it significantly changes the profile, cost profile of fleets again. So this nature of, of a fleet will absolutely change the more be, more EVs we bring on board and the way we use V2G can change that as well. So how will that impact them on the fleet policy? On, on the final one, you can see certainly today, our fleet policy today is probably dictated very much by cost and value for money, but it's not in isolation. A fleet policy decision is made around environmental cons considerations, safety considerations and value. So with V2G coming on board, we can certainly see that this will be able to reduce the cost and that will further um, promote electric vehicles and, and it begins to satisfy all criteria. Again, fit for purpose has to be the primary factor in all of these. So these, uh, these missing leafs in part of this trial will be fit for purpose first and foremost. And we hope to demonstrate beyond that, that we will get additional value from this and understand how, how we can translate that through into fleets as well. So conclusion, and I'll probably, I'll do my best to, to try and wrap it up uh, Bjorn, but uh, I guess, you know, that, that, that point there before, right? Mobility and energy, this is, this is opening up significantly new opportunities and ones that the value, uh, we, we haven't even really considered in Australia today. So we hope to, to iron it all out and understand it. The REVS project will be very, very important in bringing this type of, of structure to Australia and giving us that roadmap to move forward. So it will be very simple and plug in and earn money. Fleet managers, we want to really understand that change in dynamic of moving that vehicle from just with, you know, what color is it? What, you know, how far is it going to go to now being uh, driving the, the correct behaviors from the fleet, from the fleet drivers, uh, to now making sure we go from a, from a, uh, in, into a cost positive perspective and, and very much accelerate the, the, the uptake of, of EVs within Australia as well. well thanks. Time. <laughs> right on time. Thanks, guys. Mm -hmm. So we'll move now to our Q&A session facilitated by Dan. If you can all put your questions in the Q&A and just let us know where you're from so we can start to aggregate and ask those questions to Dean and Bjorn. Thanks, Dan. Yeah, great. Thank you. And congratulations, guys, on this, uh, this project and really exciting, obviously. And thanks for the presentation. That was great. There's a few uh, questions that have come through and uh, I'll try to do my best to, to feed them to you. And also I've got some of my own and my team in the background asking me questions. Um, so I guess the first one that came through was around the, you know, look, this is, this is obviously a trial, so you're trying to learn things. So some of these questions have to be said in the light of this is, this is a trial, but I guess the first question is around the infrastructure around Australia in general, you know, how wide will this, will this go and will you find that there's stranded assets if, um, if B2G seem to be the right thing to do in the future and maybe beyond that. Yeah. So, so, I mean, there's some... I think it's a, a still a, um, a technology that's got room to improve. Um, but I think if you if you think back to the old, if you make the, the analogy with solar, um, I don't think anyone who installed solar kind of early on in, in that technology curve regretted it. Um, they all very much benefited from that and we could only learn by doing. Um, the other thing I would say is that Australia hasn't got um, as many EV charges as in many other places. Um, and so maybe we, maybe would that benefits us in, in some way. And maybe the, the third thing to say is that a lot of, when you think of um, kind of uh, on route charging and fast charging, um, it's pretty unlikely, I think, that um, we'll be doing V to G in those 
contexts because in those contexts it's really your mobility is the absolute priority you just want to charge as much as possible to keep moving um, and so this v to g is, is probably much more applied to um, home charging or um, charging at work um, where i think there's still um, i don't know hundreds of thousands of, of charges yet to be installed right um the next one it's quite a technical question in fact this is quite a technical area so to the extent possible we'll try to keep it simple um but there is a question here about i think it's from bryn from um, lake macquarie council and i think what he's asking is around you know the benefits of having a decentralized network versus something like snowy hydro so in terms of you know the lossy the loss factors over the network and things like that is it better or worse to have this stuff decentralized or centralized I, i'll take that one as well um i think horses for courses and what we are seeing in the electricity system definitely is that there's a move towards decentralization um, but there's also a move, I would say, um, towards diversity. So we need to have solar, we need to have wind because they um, complement each other. We need to have renewable generation, and we also need to have um, storage. Um, and so we need to have really fast acting storage and we need to have longer term storage, what's sometimes called deep storage versus shallow storage. Um, and we also need to have that storage kind of co-located with, with loads, so with customers' properties. Um, as well as at a utility scale. So um, we need it all. Um, and the sooner we can get all, the, the better we'll be off. Great. Look, I mean, I've got a question about just generally the space. Obviously, there's been a lot of international you know, studies, trials. There's a, as you probably know, there's an academic in, um, I think it's Canada, who runs News, and he's been doing this for a long, long time. I mean, what do you think is the stuff that needs to be worked through in the Australian context and generally from what's already been sort of, you know, worked through globally? What do you see the sort of local, the local challenges and, and, and areas we need to cover? Um, so there's a fair amount of boring stuff in that um, basket, if I dare say so, around um, certification of um, devices in the Australian um, context. Um, and also just setting up the business processes by which kind of data is transferred and, and value is bid into our market. Our market's um, quite different to the Canadian one and, and relatively unique um, around the world. Um, and yeah, we just, everyone just needs to learn and develop the systems for how to bring this um, into a commercial domain. Great. Um, there's a question there from Ian from Energy Queensland around when you're sort of putting this proposal up, did you have a sense of where the market might be going? How many charges will be V2B? Um, well, charges plus vehicles, I guess, the combination being V2G ready? Uh, no, I don't have a view on that. I don't know if they need to. It, well, well, again, uh, and I can see some of the other questions around, well, what impact will it have on the battery and so on and so forth. So obviously the, the, the parcel of, that, that we're participating in with this, um, Nissan on board, obviously Nissan's role is really important as well. Um, they're obviously very much in, in terms of, of, of understanding the nature of the impact this potentially could have on, on, on the battery. Um, beyond that, as I say, certainly we do think that um, any any vehicle will, will be almost capable of of um, VTG in some sense or form in the near future. But again, it's around how we deliver that. How how is it parcelled up? What are the social impacts? So so we we'll hopefully we'll get an understanding as we run through this what the future predictions of, of that could be. But hopefully, much wider than today. <laughs> Great. Um, I mean, there's some questions there around the cost of setting up the charger and the, whether they're compliant at the moment. I mean, just in, I guess in generally in terms of the test that you're running, this sort of trial that you're running, to what extent is it sort of reasonably commercialised? Um, you know, equipment, it, has it got a cost yet? Is it, is it trying to be compliant? Uh, where, where is it at? Yeah, so I'd, I'd say the vehicles are very cost competitive. Um, people are very much buying this and lease without being able to do v2g to date um the, the bi-directional chargers are the kind of newer um part of the system um, and they are 
kind of going through certification at the moment. Um, and then we'll be getting some of the first, well, we'll be getting the first ones in Australia. Um, they then, as a, as a newer technology um, and as a piece of electronics, I would point out, um, I think have got quite a, a positive, um, well, positive but very rapidly declining um, cost curve ahead of them. We've, we've shown that we've been able to scale the manufacture of power electronics extremely efficiently. Um, and these devices, once they start to be produced at scale, will be coming down that I think, um, very quickly. Great. Yeah, there's a question here, that I, and, and I guess then you alluded to it before around the battery degradation issue with bidirectional charging. And, and I've seen everything from it's a huge issue to it could actually be the opposite. Um, have you got a view on that, that at the moment? Or is that sort of something you're going to be looking at in the trial? Yeah. No, I'm, ha I'm happy to speak on that now. So um, the reason for starting with the contingency FCAS service, like I said, is because we will only use, um, kind of draw power from the battery very infrequently, maybe a dozen times a year. And when we do do so, these contingency events um, only last for a matter of seconds to a, a few minutes. Uh, before then, to, to link it back to, to hydro, um, within 15 minutes, hydro is spun up um, and is then able to, to rebalance the system kind of going forward for the next hours. So we are only using kind of less than 10% of the battery capacity and only doing so, say, a dozen times a year. Um, so that's why we started there, and that's kind of the very conservative place to start, which makes sense when you're working with a government fleet and doing the first trial in Australia. Um, but the, what we've found from the international kind of academic literature and, and industry literature um, is that the number of cycles is, is not, so not the, the greatest driver of, of battery degradation. Um, first of all, the, the stresses put on the battery during driving are significantly more than um, what it will ever be putting on them um, through the bidirectional charges. Um, and then it's the other big effects are just age, like calendar age. They age, unfortunately, much like we do. Um, and the temperature at which they are operated um, and the kind of intensity, so the, um, the peak currents um, that you put them under. I mean, again, that's where um, we'll be doing a lot less in V2G services than in driving. Um, and there have actually been some... Um, some research that suggested that on the whole, there'll be a benefit from in battery lifetime by doing V2G. Um, because V2G involves kind of smart monitoring and controlling of the charging, uh, it means that you can maintain the battery capacity within its best tolerances, both in terms of how quickly you charge it and also the state of charge. I should have mentioned that another big driver of um, battery degradation is whether you top it up to like 100%, and bring it down to close to 0%. At those extremities is where you do more wear and tear on your battery. So by having V2G much in this trial, we'll be monitoring that state of charge um, and really keeping the, the vehicles in their optimum range um, for longer than would normally be done with just a simple um, plug that just charges it to, to full as quickly as possible. Right, well, I guess, Dean, um, you, know, you alluded before to the you know, the benefits for you being getting a sense of the customer engagement and how that's going to work. I mean, it's quite a technical thing to explain, uh, you know, the battery degradation. Have you had any thoughts about how you're going to do that moving forward? Yeah, so, so, so uh, again, with, with, with this, a, a lot of it is um, with any asset, um, the costs are good until you actually put a human behind the wheel. Um, so, again, what we, want, what we really want to do is, is, is not just... Um, I guess to be able to explain from this project it is the manufacturer's side um, that the you know, obviously Miss Leaf warrant this uh, and this sort of monitored behavior. Um, what we really want, want to be able to try and understand is, is those opportunities uh, as well to, to, to partake. So the last thing that we want to, to do as part of the trial, and inevitably this, this will occur, is that uh, we've parked the car, but we haven't plugged it in. So we, maybe we've missed an opportunity to participate in, in, in the market. Um, so we want to try and, uh, and understand that, those challenges as well. So not so much the budget but the opportunity that we feel to, 
to even uh, overcome that. But the more data that we have to be able to explain the the potential sites or potential impacts uh, and overcome the the myths in this, that will then we feel that will will start to add further value to the secondary uh, market of BEVs. Uh, we start to look at the capacity of that uh, you know, battery in in that second hand market, and uh, that will trans should translate through to to improve resale as well. Yeah, great. Um, I mean, there's a question here then around. And this is, I guess, an interesting run about the FCAS market in general, how deep it is, and whether there's enough sort of, um, that, you know, for, for people who don't understand, that market has a certain, I guess, pool that, that, that is available. Um, so, so do you have a view, I guess, beyond, you know, either, you know long term, is there going to be enough in that market um, to, sustain, to sustain this kind of growth? Yeah, it's a, it's a really common question, and I think um, I'd frame it as kind of a million dollar question. Um, time will tell. Um, it is, as the, the person who asked the question um, is right to say, it's a relatively shallow market, um, but it is a, a, um, a service that is only becoming more and more critical and more and more needed, um, particularly regulation FCAS, so where you um, adjust supply and demand on a kind of five second basis all the time throughout the year rather than just during storms and other contingencies. Um, so we really, the role of, of energy storage and balancing the grid um, is only going to increase as we decarbonize the grid and, and get rid of more of the old fossil generators. Um, so that the valuation of, of speed of, um, and of flexibility um, is only going to increase and that may be um, through other markets other than the FCAS market, but at a kind of fundamental physical level, flexibility and speed are only becoming more important um, and will continue, therefore be remunerated appropriately. Great, thank you. Um, uh, sorry, that was Philip Cook, by the way, um, from CU Fremantle. Uh, yeah, there's a question here from uh, Glenn at Lake Macquarie Council which is an interesting one, and it sort of might lead into a bit of the energy market collaboration piece. So obviously you, you have, I think, Evo Energy and ActuAGO as participants, and you know, getting them on board that project has probably been key to, key to making it work. So the question there is around how to get them engaged, and I guess um, there's a secondary question, which I'll ask in a second, but maybe if we answer that one first. Yeah, I mean, my my take on that is that every participant in this um, kind of has a, a carrot and a stick motivator. Um, Evo, for instance, like the stick for them would be that if we just have mass deployments of electric vehicles all just randomly doing their own thing, or probably not random, well, random, but in quite a correlated way, everyone comes home at the same time, plugs in and just lets it start charging at maximum, um, they're going to have an issue. But there's also an upside for them in that if... Um, these vehicles can be managed in a smart way. Um, it can really help them manage voltage, um, congestion, other issues that they may have on their network. Um, and similarly for, for actual AGL, um, there's a huge opportunity with electric vehicles to, to simply sell more units of energy, but the much bigger opportunity is to do much smarter things um, to provide more services to their customers, such as vehicle to grid. So, um, yeah, I can't like I can only report that they were both um, and everyone in the consortium um, extremely enthusiastic um, and proactive at participating. And I, and I think I mean the, the ACT jurisdiction is probably fairly unique, and it was lucky that in a sense that we we got the trial off the ground here, given that the the close relationship between ActuHL and Evo Energy exists. Um, that that will make I guess future. V2G operations projects, you know, I guess we'll, we'll pave the way um, for uh, and, and part of our knowledge sharing uh, of, of the of the project. Uh, a lot of the other uh, certainly energy providers uh, and retailers um, we, we'll, we'll look to to involve and, and um, as I say, try and, and try and uh, share the, the knowledge and and, uh, and and make it make it easier for that to occur in future. Great, thank you for that. And I guess a, a follow-up question from that one is really around, you know, who's going to capture this value in the future? Like, from two perspectives, so obviously the customer, but then also, you know, because you get billed through a retailer, you know, the network provider, you know, who do we see 
you know, that, that value, where do we see that value being captured, do you think? Um, I'll keep going first. Um, yeah, that's a that's a good a good question, and there's um, multiple parties involved across the transport system and the electricity system, um, all of whom are going to want to be remunerated for the time and energy that they put into these services. Um, there's a huge opportunity. The opportunity is huge. How that gets shared is something that will be worked out in the wash. Um, and I think I'd also just mention that there's not only the existing players. Um, there's quite a lot of other players who are pretty adjacent to this field um, who may wish to kind of get involved in, in the future. Yeah, great. Um, I mean, this is an interesting one, but probably for both of you is around, you know, the, the coincident issue, you know, vehicles travel around and they need to sort of all be there at the same time to deliver value. So I guess from a from a fleet manager's perspective, you know, how, how could that be operationally managed? Um, actually, it probably is a fleet manager question. Like, how, how realistic is it to orchestrate that the vehicles are there at the same time when they're needed? Yeah, well, well, well again, it's, it's modeling that behavior and, and, and that's from existing data, future data, you know, in, in terms of, of, of booking and, and getting to understand the nature of the normal use of these vehicles. So I saw a question there says it's probably worthwhile um, spend 20,000 on an EV put in the garage and just plugging it in. Um, we want we want to use these as fleet vehicles first and foremost. And it's about understanding well, when are they available? So then when um, we, we're not going to sacrifice the driving of that vehicle to visit a patient uh, just to plug in to support the grid. So again, it's both fit for purpose. So from a fleet, fleet manager's perspective, this is looking at those additional add-on benefits that this project can bring and what value can that bring to the normal operation of a fleet asset. So that will, um, that will be the chance. That's what we want. We want to find out you know, uh, from a normal fleet of 50, when, what's the most availability, when are they? Um, so say if, it, if, if they're, um, you would expect certainly in your mid morning and mid afternoon peaks is when they're on the road. Um, uh, but again, obviously with, with the likes of, of, of um, the, the, the particular events that, that we are looking at and, and timings, it was, we're, we've estimated probably around 70% of the time uh, of this particular fleet, it should be potentially plugged in, the, but uh, you know, you know that that's uh, that's the initial view. Um, so that's obviously weekends. This is a, a government fleet, so typically Monday to Friday, uh, it should be should be plugged theoretically plugged in all weekend uh, and, and overnight. So we'll we'll work out those um, peaks and peaks and troughs uh, as we run through, and and again that's capturing that data. And, and translating it back through so then we can more accurately predict and, and therefore bid uh, in, in that market with the with the capacity that we think we will have yeah yeah that's a good good thing and that was from monica at siemens good question and i think the other point on that is probably that fleet to a great uh or most likely place to have consistent consistent um you know consistent availability so yeah another question is around the um, behavioural, you did speak a little bit beyond about behavioural, which sort of leads on from what um, Dean's been talking about. Is there anything specific that you're going to research around that aspect in terms of behavioural, um, yeah, behaviour of the, of, the, of the fleet users? Yeah, so I think this is a, a great opportunity um, to really understand the, the fleet market and the behavioural drivers as well as the financial drivers of that market. And it's something that you know, is particularly relevant because probably most people in the call know an, an awful lot um, of new car sales in Australia go to fleets. Some numbers put it above 50%. Um, and then that then drives obviously not only the, the new vehicle import um, market, but also is a significant source for the secondhand market. So yes, we'll be looking at um, understanding the doing some, some social research with fleets, um, fleet managers and fleet users and fleet owners. Um, but we'll also be doing social research on um, the wider public to see what kind of customer value propositions and, and business models um, will appeal more broadly. Yeah, great. That, that answers Shane, Shane's question, I think also from local buy. So thanks for that. Um, 
Yeah, so I guess the other question that's come up from Bryn is around the, um, you know, I guess vehicle to building or vehicle to home or, you know, what are the sort of benefits that could be accrued there as opposed to bi-directional charging into the grid? Um, is there sort of a, a trade-off there or what's the, what's your sense of behind the meter opportunities? Yeah, so I mean, in terms of trade-offs, I would say that it's not really a matter of trade-offs. It's the term that gets used um, all the time in the electricity world is around value stacking when it comes to batteries. So being able to drive values from, from this service as well as this service as well as this service and trying to stack in as many services and co-optimize them as best as possible. Um, and that's really key to making any battery work, be that a, a battery um, in a residential house or the, the big Tesla big battery. It's about being able to derive values from multiple sources. Um, so while we're not demonstrating any vehicle to, be, vehicle to building or vehicle to home in, in this trial, um, that's absolutely like um, one of the things that the ANU will be looking at and looking at the, the kind of case study at hand of the ACT government, um, their electricity bills, what are their prices, what are their demand charges, um, and seeing how they can be um, put kind of folded into, into this proposition as well. Um, I think kind of getting to the, the question from Alex Summer as well around um, kind of just comparing the costs of these vehicles to what revenue might make um, is really worth pointing out that just the batteries kind of by capacity or per kilowatt hour um, that you're getting in an electric vehicle um, are really quite affordable. Um, and then they're just very, very affordable when you consider the fact that you're mostly using it as a car. Um, and then you kind of are getting all of these additional energy services, almost with some degree of um, hand waving, almost you're getting them for free. Um, so it's a, an incredibly good value proposition, we think. Okay. Um, there's a question here from James at Smart uh, at Smartfleet. And I think you can sort of broaden his question around just standards. And there've been a few questions about standards in general. And, you know, how's this gonna play out in terms of the standards between connectors, the standards of um, obviously the vehicles themselves. I think someone from Jaguar Land Rover has sort of brought up some question, uh, some uh, comments there as well. Is this a is this a standards issue as well as much as a you know behavioural slash um, technical issue in other ways? Yeah, I don't know. If, I wouldn't play these things off. We kind of we need the whole supply chain to be functioning. Otherwise, this doesn't work. Um, and so standards around. There's a, a question here that I might pick off at the same time around the um, in, that it needs to be the charger needs to be certified as an inverter using AS4777. Um, so yes, that needs to happen. Um, and then there are also certifications to be done by Nissan as well as Chatmo, which is the um, charging communication protocol. Um, and it's probably the Chatmo or CCS um, standard that the initial question was related to. Um, and so Chatmo currently can do V to G. Um, CCS cannot, but CCS, the next version of that, CCS 2.0, um, is slated to be able to do B2G. And I don't know, if, I don't always forget when that's slated to come out, but something on the order of 2023. Yeah, um, 2023. And, and so hopefully, that, hopefully we can get some standardization around all standards, really, um, and that can only expedite things. Right, yeah, and I think there's some work that AEMO is going to be doing as well in that in that space to try to help, and I'm sure other other standards bodies around around Australia will be doing as well. Um, so, I guess would you guys like to make any final comments? I mean, I think that's all the questions that we have. Um, no, I thought this has been this has been some really well informed and, and um, on point questions. So, definitely covered everything from my perspective. Dean, did you have anything? Yeah, no, again, you know, this is just a, you know, the, the project will run for a couple of years and obviously a, a big part of that will be knowledge sharing, you know, the, the, you know, the EVC, um, we, we'll absolutely get across, because again, this, we, we think this will absolutely accelerate the, the uptake, uh, certainly of, of, of ZEVs. Uh, into fleets uh, and uh, again just be able to to do it in a way that will not be that hard you know that's what we really want to achive um, and inevitably there'll be some 
rocky points along the road, but uh, you know we, we, we'll, we'll work them through, and, and uh, yeah, so certainly come out the other side um, and, and make it a lot easier for everyone to do this um, moving forward. Great. All right, that's fantastic. Yeah, so it's really exciting. We'll all be watching very carefully as it develops, I'm sure. Um, and thanks everyone for attending and asking such great questions. If you have other questions, you can just email us, go to chartstogether.org and you know, tell other people to sign up to the program. Um, we'll be having lots of other great webinars coming up. So yeah, chartstogether.org forward slash join is where you join. And yeah, I'd like to thank obviously very much Dean and, and Bjorn for sharing their valuable time and insights. And, um, and thank you, which will probably also be given to Arena for funding this and they also funded Charge Together. So um, yeah, great work that they're doing as well. So yep, yeah, thanks everybody and we'll see you again next time.